you'll take your Bibles and open them to Luke chapter 1. And Sam, I adjusted this Wednesday. Can you hear me okay? Is it too loud? I like it loud. Do what, Sam? It's fine. It's fine. Okay. I was shooting for the person sitting in the back, so <laughs> glad to know I got you. You heard what Alex said. He said he liked it. I like it. Like it. We have been looking at Charles Stanley's book, The Wonderful Spirit Filled Life. And he has gotten to the point, or we've gotten to the point, almost finishing the book, and he talks about how do we know if the Holy Spirit is leading us? Uh, people will ask the question, I don't know if it's God talking to me or Satan. God. God. <laughs> Amen. Uh, and that's a, that's a valid question. Is it, a, is it just our thoughts? Is it just what we're thinking? Or is it God actually speaking to us? And so Charles Stanley says there's four markers to look at in God's Word as we try to judge. Is it Holy Spirit leading us to do something. Um, we've talked about Him guiding us. We've talked about when we are looking to Him, we need to come into His presence neutral as Jesus did. And what I mean by that is we don't come in with our agenda. We don't come in with our expectations. We come in and lay it before God and we allow Him to speak to our heart. We allow Him to tell us and declare to us what He wants. And that's the direction we need to go in. A lot of times we fail at that point because we come to God constantly asking Him. Uh, I'm reminded of when Abigail and Ethan were little, and you may remember this in your children too, they, you always wanted them to be able to speak because you wondered what the world's going on in their minds and then they learned to talk and you wish they'd be quiet a little bit. <laughs> one of the things that they constantly did was they ask why, 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 and they just wanted to know, but after a while it gets on your nerves, doesn't it? <laughs> we need to give God a chance to explain why, and we need to give him the opportunity. And so we're going to start today looking at the first marker of how we know the Holy Spirit is speaking to us as individuals, speaking to us as a family, and speaking to us as a body of Christ. Because I guarantee you, I learned a long time ago, not everybody in this room 100% agrees with everything, right? Uh, we could almost say that a lot of us don't agree 50% of everything, right? So there's a lot of opinions sitting here in the room, and there's a lot of expectations sitting here in the room for the body of Christ to function we have to function on his expectations and his will so that we all come together in unity to do it, okay? And so we're going to look today at Luke chapter 1. That's where we're going to start. Luke chapter 1, verse 76. It says, And thou, child, talking about John. This is a prophecy about John the Baptist and his life. Right. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. And then verse 77 says, To give knowledge and salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. To give light to them who sit in darkness and to the shadow in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. The marker today is peace. If you don't have peace, I wouldn't make a move. There's been times in my life when I have wanted something so badly for God to do something. And all my friends were telling me, just do something. Just do something. But if God leads us to a place, can we move from that place unless He moves us and gives us peace about it? 
You see, sometimes we do things and, and stay in certain areas of our life just because God led us there and He hadn't moved us yet. You see, you have to have the peace to make that move. The old phrase is jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. That's what we're talking about here. How can we move from God's will out of God's will unless he gives us peace to take that step? And that's what Charles Stanley is telling us here. I want you to look. Turn to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to look at, Hope asked me, she said, what passages are you preaching out of today? And I said, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? Matthew chapter 8 is where we're going to be reading from first. I will share this, that this is not in my notes. The Lord changed what I wanted to say last night during my quiet time. So I pray that he uses this. The word peace here is the Greek word irene. And it means the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And in this assurance, fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatever, whatsoever sort that is. You see, we have the assurance of our position and our relationship with God through Jesus Christ that we are content with that we are set with that. We fear nothing. And Scripture teaches us this. But this is what peace is. We don't fear anything because of our relationship with God. Nothing can shake us because of our relationship with God. And you notice I'm not saying fellowship. My fellowship with God is up and down sometimes because of me, and yours is too. That has nothing to do with my relationship. And we need to be settled on that because, see, Ethan lives in Raleigh. We don't know what he does. We don't know what he, just what he tells us, right? And we trust him. That, but he still has a relationship with me. We just don't have very much fellowship right now. See the difference? His relationship isn't affected by anything. His fellowship may be. And so we look at this, and this is what peace is. Because of our relationship through Jesus Christ, we are not shaken by anything. Doesn't mean that we don't pay attention, that we don't see things, that we're not aware of things. It just means that it doesn't really bother us like it bothers everybody else pandemic those of us who have a relationship in Jesus Christ yes we're aware of it yes we, we deal with it and all but we're not shaken by it like some people are there are people who don't get out of their houses out of fear they have no peace so that's what we're talking about here Jesus said, and I mean, John came to guide their feet in the way of peace, directing them toward Jesus. And then we get to Matthew 8, verse 24. Okay? Matthew 8, 24. We read a familiar passage. And if this is Jesus' peace, I want us to look at what he says here about Jesus and see him. Jesus had just talked to his disciples and he's been teaching them and he comes to verse 24 and it says, Behold, there are what roads? Well, let's start with 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. So they're getting in the boat. They're going to cross the Sea of Galilee. It says, And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being covered by the waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? That he got up, then he got up and rebuked the winds, and the sea became perfectly calm. 
And the men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now we all have pictures in our mind of the boat that Jesus was in. I thought for a long time that he was down below and he was you know, protected from the wind and the rain. That's why he didn't know what was going on. He was down there in the little cabin and all. But if you look at the fishing boats that they had back then, they didn't have cabins. It was an open boat. It'd be kind of like one of our John boats or something. A little bigger. Jesus was laying there on the boat asleep. It says the, the winds and the rain, the storm was so great that the waves were coming up over the sides of the boat. Are y'all like sleepers? Not me. I, I can go to sleep and I don't wake up a lot. I mean, I'm just dead to the world, aren't I? <laughs> Takes me about two seconds, no longer than two minutes, and I'm gone. I can remember when Abigail was born, I started before, I've never had this happen to me before in my life, but I heard every little thing at night when she was born. I changed, now I've reverted back. Jesus is laying there. I could not lay in a boat. I could lay in a boat and go to sleep. Honestly, I could. On a hot summer day, anytime, I could lay in a boat and go to sleep. I could lay in a boat and go to sleep going down and just drifting down the river. Just like at Jungle Rapids, that lazy river, you get in the inner tube, you just float around. I could go to sleep. But I guarantee you, I've been on a boat one time out a fishing boat with a friend and out there we went out a little off the coast to fish and it was so bad that day that the back end of the boat would go down and it'd cover the motors and the front end of the boat would go down and it'd cover I mean it was just like this there was no sleeping on that boat <laughs> for me there was no moving on that I don't think I moved on Ronnie Reedy's boat for five hours. I stood there with my back up against something. My feet didn't move. I didn't say a word for five hours. I'd never been in anything like that before. He promised to take me back on a clear day one time if we've never made it. One day we might. But there was, a, there was no way to sleep there. I, I guarantee you I could be tired and I could sleep. Jesus was asleep during that. And it was more than that because it was raining. Not only was the waves pushing him around and all, and the waves coming up over the boat and splashing on him, because I guarantee you they splashed on him, but it was raining. And he's asleep. And his disciples are worried and they're, they're doing things. They're trying to figure out what in the world to do because they're fixing. They were fishermen. They've been out of there before. They knew what was happening. They're going to die. Because there's nothing they can do. Flip over to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Now this is the account that Luke records of the same thing. Luke chapter 8, verse 22. It says here that Jesus had just talked about uh, not covering the lamp, and putting out uh, the lights. He talks about his mother. He's been teaching his mothers and brothers and says, who are my mothers and brothers? And after this, he comes to verse 22 in Luke chapter 8. And it says, now on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into the boat and he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep. Okay. And a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. Okay. The word swamp there actually means that the boat was filling up with water. 
It says, and they came to Jesus and woke him up and said, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and he became calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? And they were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? Now, most of the time when you hear about this passage, they're talking about faith. Our faith in God. I want us to look at Jesus' peace. Because here it says that the waves weren't just coming and he wasn't getting wet. There's the possibility he was laying in water. A good place for a nap, isn't it? All of y'all going home today for a nap, you find the nearest pond and you just get out and lay down in it. <laughs> and see how long you'll sleep. This is, must be a very sound sleep from the Lord for him to be able to sleep through all this. Flip over to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. It says, on that day, same situation, same event, when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in a boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. They weren't alone out there. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And Jesus himself was in the stern. So this tells us where he was laying down. He was in the front of the, uh, in the back of the boat. I'm sorry. You can tell I'm not a nautical person. He was in the back of the boat. Now, if this was like Ronnie Reedy's boat on that day we went out together, the back of the boat's going down in the water when it pitches. So Jesus is back there, you know, he, I'm making the point that he isn't just back there comfortably laying down, sheltered from all this. He's in the midst of it. Says he was in the stern asleep on a cushion. He wasn't just asleep, he was comfortable. He had his mattress with him. You see, when you read the different Gospels about the same thing, you learn different stuff. So here's Jesus comfortably laying down asleep in all this stuff that's going on around him. And it says, And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now what kind of question is that? Jesus is in the boat. Jesus is right there with them. And they think they're going to die. They're with the Son of God and they think they're going to die. They're with the Messiah and they think that all this stuff that's going around them is going to take their lives. The creator of the world, brothers and sisters in Christ, isn't going to be taken down by his creation. Do I need to repeat that? The creator of everything that goes on in this world isn't going to be affected, isn't going to be hurt, isn't going to be lose his life over the things that he created. Amen. It isn't going to happen. And yet that's the thought in his disciples. How many times do we think that things are so overbearing, things are so bad, and Jesus is with us, praise the Lord, every day when Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Right, friend? Right. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Every day with Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that we aren't going to have storms. I heard a preacher one time said, you're either coming out of a storm, you're in a storm, or you're going into one. That's just life, is it not? And if the Son of Man is there in the storm, there's peace. 
It says, they ask him, don't you care that we're going to die? And he says, he got up and he rebuked the wind and the sea and said, hush or peace, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. Amen. God. What control he has that when he spoke, the storm stopped. God. When he spoke, he created when he spoke, all things came into existence. Did it not? Genesis 1-1. And when he spoke, the storm ceased and it became calm. No more rocking of the boat. No more waves splashing over the side. All that was gone. As soon as he said the word. It says, and he said to them, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now I want you to think back to my definition or the Greek word for faith. I mean, right. peace. Irene, the tranquil state of the soul assured of its salvation through Christ. Okay, I'm going to change it a little bit. Jesus' peace is the tranquil state of his soul assured of his relationship with the Father. That's right. And because Jesus had this tranquil state of his soul assured because of his relationship with the Father, he could go to sleep and sleep soundly like no one else during that storm. Amen. That's right. Why? He knew who he was in Yahweh. Brothers and sisters, if we know who we are through Jesus Christ and God Almighty, though hell blow up around us, we can calmly, with the peace of God, go through it. Amen? Amen, that's right. We may not think we can. We may sit there and we may th say, how in the world can I get through this? How can I live through this? You say, how do you know it works, Brother Hugh? You've been there. I will raise my hand and testify that with Jesus, if you would realize who you are in Him and that you're where He wants you to, you would not believe what you can live through. But it's because of your relationship with Him and the Father through Him that you can do such a thing. And you can live through it with grace and mercy and love and not anger and bitterness and hate. Because you have the peace of God in your soul. What does Jesus say? He says, my peace I leave with you. What's he talking about there? He says, my peace I give to you. What's he talking about there? Louise, you start to say something. I said peace within. Okay, peace within, but what's he talking about there? He said, it's not like the world's peace. It's the Holy Spirit. What's the evidence of the Holy Spirit living in a believer's life? Love, joy, peace, peace. Okay. peace. If we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we have the peace of God in us. Amen? Amen. And if the peace of God dwells in us, then it ought to be evident in our lives that when the storms come and when things are dangerous and when we think we're going to die and we think all is lost, that we calmly, because of our assurance, are in a state of mind and heart that nothing can shake us because of our relationship with God. Maybe it's right. Now, does that mean that no harm comes to me? No. No. 
I may be like Brother John and fall in the bathroom tomorrow morning. In fact, there's many times, Brother, I too have sat there and said, how do I get out of here without falling? Right? Right. right. Things happen. Remember I said a storm, you're either in a storm, or you're out of a storm, or you're going through one. Something is going on all the time in our lives. How do we live in it? How do we go through it? We have, if we're believers in Jesus Christ and we've been saved in His Spirit, He's given us His peace. He's given us His, His Spirit. Why do we not allow Him to do what He wants to in our lives? Jesus says to them what? His disciples, when they're sitting there saying, we're going to die. This is so bad. We're going to die. He says, why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? So when Monday comes, why are we afraid? Nothing. Nothing, Alex. Tuesday comes, why are we afraid? Nothing. Nothing. Because we don't have that faith. We have little faith. Now I'm walking over here to Brother John. We have, we have a certain understanding and relationship. That's right. Jesus gives us two pennies all the time to rub together, doesn't he, brother? Why do we fear when the bills come? If we are honest before God and if we lay it out before God and we, with what he gives us, we use wisely and we honor him with it, why do we fear when the bills come? Lack of faith. Why do we try to figure out things ourselves? Lack of faith. Why do we have lack of faith? Why are we afraid? No peace. You see, if we know who our great God is and we live in Him and we adore Him like we're talking about and we bow before Him and we give Him our lives and we give Him our families and we give Him our church, there is no reason that we can't live in peace. Because we need that. We need it. The only time we don't live that way is when we begin to operate in fear. And His perfect love does what? Cast out all fear. Cast out all fear. Right. So if I'm living in fear, there's no peace. And I'm not living in His perfect love. I'm not acknowledging Him in all my ways so He can direct my paths. I am not acknowledging Him as the God of my life. I've taken it back. And for me, being the controlling person that, that I like to be so that I'm comfortable, there's no peace in that. I'll tell you that right now. But for me to do that, then I'm saying, God, I can do a better job than you. And the boat sinks. When I take control, the boat sinks. And the winds don't stop. The storm keeps beating. Jesus says, I give you this peace. It's not like what the world gives you. And he says in that passage, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Philippians chapter 4, verse 5 says, let your reasonable, reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, now we like to quote this verse, the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What does the peace of God do for us, the Holy Spirit do for us? He guards my mind so I don't get wandering off in left field thinking, oh me, oh me, and I become afraid. He guards my heart, my emotions that motivate me to do things. He guards them so that I remain in that perfect peace. And when the hardship comes and the grief comes and the hurt comes, we acknowledge it, we deal with it, but we don't lose ourselves over. Does that make sense? 
You say, Brother Hugh, you're being awfully harsh. No, I'm being realistic with the truth of the word. God's word is that it's possible to live in the midst of storms of life, whether it's in the midst of death or whether it's in the midst of, of divorce or whether it's in the midst of, of uh, whatever it may be. We can live through the storms of life in peace. Why? If we're believers in Jesus Christ, He's given it to us. We can lose our jobs. Been there. I'll even go one further. You don't have to lose your job. You can quit your job. Been there. Just walked off. Told the boss, cut me a check. Pay me what you owe me. I'm out of here. I'm not saying that was God's will at the time. But you can do it in peace knowing that He is going to lead you and guide you. He's not going to forsake you. I'll do you one better. In the church. The body of Christ. Believers who love the Lord, who love the church, who are unified by the Spirit. Been told more than once in my life by deacons in a church, not this one, but in other churches, you do what we tell you to do or we're going to withhold our tithes and offering and that way you can't get paid and that way your family's going to get hurt. I don't know where the wisdom of God comes. Well, I do. It comes from the Holy Spirit. The Hope and I were young when that first happened one time. And I looked at that man right in his eyes and I said, Sir, you're not my provider. God is. And you don't have to answer to him for withholding your tithes. But God's always taken care of me and he's always going to take care of me. Peace from God. So that no matter what we wake up in, no matter what we face every day, the grace of God is more than sufficient to give us peace that we can walk in it with integrity, with honesty before our living God. I hear a lot of talking. I read articles about why young people are leaving the church. There's a lot of reasons being given. But if you sit down and talk to some of them, it's not about music, it's not about this, it's not about the other. They are leaving the church in droves because there is no integrity of what we say and how we live. You say, how do you know that, Brother Hugh? I used to be a youth pastor and I asked them. They hear one thing, and I can remember this. You think back to when you first became a Christian. You hear one thing at church and you see something entirely different at home. I remember that. I couldn't understand my family. We, we'd been in church ever since I could remember. And we, we were taught one thing. We heard one thing. Brother Ken at church as they shared the word of God with us. And as soon as we walked out the door and headed home, it was an entirely different ball game. Integrity. We can live in integrity and peace if we allow the Holy Spirit to do what He wants to in our lives. And you know what He wants to do in your life? In my life? He wants me to make me like Jesus. I can't sit back and say, this is Brother Hugh, this is just the way it is, this is what you get. No, not if I'm a Christian because the Holy Spirit's work is to come into my life and conform me into the image of Jesus Christ so I can think like Him and I can be like Him and I can live like Him and therefore I'm a light and salt to the world. 
And if I'm stuck into this is just the way I am and you just have to accept me the way I am, I'm stuck in self and not in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, what I want you to see is if we don't have peace, we better not move. Because the Holy Spirit, when He is on in our life, and when He is directing and He's declaring to us the will of God, He will give us peace. And that's what Charles Stanley's talking about. That's the first mark. You say, how long does it take to get peace? It can take a five-minute prayer, and it can, in my life, one time it took nine years. I lived in a storm for nine years. Hope, bless her heart, endured a storm for nine years. You say, Brother Hugh, why would you put your family through that? The peace of God had to come. You see how important it is? Because when the peace of God comes and He gives us direction and guidance, then the blessings of God are going to follow. If you're seeking God, if you're asking Him for something, if you're wanting to know His will, the first thing you look for is the peace that the Holy Spirit gives to do or not to do. He'll open doors in your life. He'll open doors in the church life. He'll open doors in your family life. And as you step toward that door because you prayed for it, He'll give you peace or He'll shut the door and say no. Brothers and sisters, we have to let the Holy Spirit give us peace. And when we have peace, we can move on. But if we don't have peace, we dare not make a move. Whether it's individual life, family, or the church, we dare not make a move. Because if we make a move without the peace of God, we are stepping out of His perfect will. We're stepping away from the center of His will. We're moving away from Him to try to do something ourselves. And that's not where we need to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. That all begins with salvation. Because you see, if we're not saved, if we haven't asked Jesus to come into our life through the Holy Spirit, forgive us of our sins, then we are constantly without peace. We are constantly living in without peace because it's not there. The Holy Spirit isn't there. And he is the spirit of peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Amen? Amen. God. And so it starts with salvation. The freely realizing our need and giving ourselves to Jesus because he died to save us from our sins and we give ourselves to him. And that peace comes in the Holy Spirit when we do that. And from then on, it's just walking with Him. Walking in the Spirit, Paul talks about it all. You may be saved today, and you may say, I don't have peace in my life. Yes, you do. You're just not utilizing it and living in it. You say, well, I don't have peace in my life. Well, then there's only two reasons. Either you're not saved and the Holy Spirit isn't there, or you're quenching and grieving Him. Brittany's going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. Whatever you need in your life, it is there if you're saved. It is there in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's giving you everything you need to live this life in peace. If you'll just do it. Whatever He has for you today, whatever you're going through, He wants you to have peace in it. Whatever you decisions you have to make, He wants you to have peace about it. Now I'm going to clarify something as we start our invitation. Wise counsel is a good thing, but I don't find peace by asking Skylar what her opinion is. I don't ask Ken Butler for his opinion. I may ask. 
But then I go to God and I sit between for the Holy Spirit and I say, God, what's, you, what's your opinion? Because that's the only one that matters. I may get wise counsel from Ken. I may get wise counsel from Skyler. But it's the Holy Spirit that I have to seek. Otherwise, they're just feeding me and I make a decision according to my desires, right? So whatever God's speaking to you about this thing of the Holy Spirit and peace in your life as you make decisions. Decide, number one, to invite him in and be saved. Number two, to allow him to do what he wants to do. As we sing, I'm going to be standing here. We have deacons here that can... Is this mine? Okay, thank you. Deacons here who will be here to talk to you. If you need to come and talk to us about it, if you need someone to pray with you, whatever he wants you to do, do it during the invitation. As we sing number... Hymn 225, Jesus Paid It All. Okay. 225, Jesus Paid It All. in our lives that the Holy Spirit makes. And Father, in all the decisions we make and in all the storms we live through, may there be peace because of our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.